the well fueling program is a 12 month program that we have for investors that takes you through from tax preparation all the way till the end of the year. So we work with you year round in making sure that you have everything that you need to succeed as an investor. Because how many of us know that a lot of us can make money, but you may not necessarily know how to keep it? And there's various things that can erode that. Taxes will, a lawsuit, um, trip to Las Vegas, those kind of things have that impact. So the whole goal of the Ultimate Wealth Building Program is that you're actually not just making money, but actually building wealth. All right, so the first stage of the Wealth Building Program is what we call a financial needs analysis. Um, with the financial needs analysis, the first thing is to determine why are you involved in real estate? Why are you doing this? So let me just have um, one or two people. Why are you Why are you here? Hmm? Okay, so he said to replace his job income. That's usually one reason because you have a boss that is um, really nice. So that's the reason. That's a good reason. All right. Freedom and financial independence. Don't we all want to be free? and not necessarily have to worry about um, money. So that's a good reason. Next. Yes. Life by design. I love that. Um, one of the reasons why I got involved in real estate wasn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily want to be financially free, although that's the ultimate goal. I just wanted to have flexibility to raise my kids. Um, I'm also a Christian and a minister. I wanted to have the time to do ministry work. And I didn't want to have to feel that I'm going to a job walking on eggshells if I have to take off because somebody, you know, my daughter is running track, and now I can't take off because A, B, C, D, E. I just want to have flexibility. And being able to establish um, a real estate portfolio gives you that flexibility because whether you're at work or not, that money is working for you. So the whole goal of the financial needs analysis stage is determining why you are invested in real estate. Because a lot of people, if you don't know why you're investing or if you don't have the right goals, you can end up making a mistake. So let's use Lawrence for example. Lawrence wants to be able to replace his current income. I can't tell you how many people have come, you know, they've gone and listened to a guru from out of town who says fire your boss on Monday. And then you go on Monday and you fire your boss, but you don't have any real estate investment, and now you're sleeping with Bubba. <laughs> so the whole goal of financial needs analysis is coming up with a plan. Yes, we want to leave our job. Yes, we don't want to continue, um, you know, having to go to a job that we necessarily don't like, but the financial needs analysis is doing an analysis to say, okay, this is what I need in order to get there and making steps to get there. But until you get there, that job that you have is the goose that is laying the golden egg right now. You kind of need to preserve that because if you have a job, you have a certain level of stability. It doesn't always happen that way, but you have a certain level of stability. I can't tell you because I've done that. You know, I was like, oh, I don't want to deal with this anymore. There was a, a, a promotion that was coming for a tax manager position, and I thought I should get the promotion. My boss called me in because I was pregnant. I'm a woman. You know, I don't know what I am. I don't know if I'm African or American. Like, I was born here but grew up in Africa, and now I'm here. Too many things going on. I just say I'm from Mars. So because I'm from Mars, he thought, you can't handle this with everything that you have going on. And so he gave the he gave the position to somebody lower than me. I got upset and I quit because I thought I'm gonna do real estate. This was in 2004, 2006. I had to go back to work, eat the humble pie, go back to the same company and consult with them. But thank God, ten years later, this is where I am. It's a step, you know. So you don't necessarily want to. Um, just go in and just make a rash decision. I tell people that real estate will fit in your life however you want it to fit in. Um, so the main thing is 
if you know why you're doing what you're doing, then you come up with a plan. And then the other thing, too, about financial needs analysis is how much time do you have? I see a lot of people saying, hey, I want to do wholesale. But if your job is demanding and then you have a family that is demanding or you're not able to make out that kind of time for wholesale and you're going to get frustrated at the end of the day and then you're going to say, oh, real estate doesn't work. No, I've never not seen real estate work. What happens is people are not put in the real estate strategy in their overall life the way that it's supposed to fit. And so that's when I realized that I could not be a wholesaler, not that I didn't want to, but I just don't have that kind of time, and that's the reason why I settled for buy and hold. And then from the buy and hold, just last year, a couple of my clients, we, we got together and bought a, a commercial self-storage. But it's, it's taken a while to be able to get here. So that's the most important thing is understand why you're doing what you're doing, what assets do you have to get there, what else can you be doing until real estate is able to completely take over. And my goal, um, you know, I tell people that I don't have to go from working five days a week to working zero days a week. If I go from working five days a week to working four days a week, then from four days to three days, three days to two, and then eventually where it's only one day, I still, I still achieved my goal um, without necessarily burning bridges right now. So I'm not one of those that will preach go and quit your job because that's not good advice. Am I being honest? Being real, keeping it real. This is a keeping it real meetup group. Okay. <laughs> All right, the next stage is tax planning and preparation. Um, one of the things that we look at when we're doing tax preparation is making sure that you're claiming all the deductions that are legally due to you. We do not advocate tax evasion. Like I said, you will be in jail with Baba, and I'm not coming to rescue you. If you come and tell me about, uh, you know, I want $10,000 refund, that is not me. No, absolutely not. I don't want... Um, you as a client, but if you want us to find legal ways, and there's enough in the real estate industry, there's enough legal ways for you not to pay more than your fair share of taxes, that's what we look out for during preparation. Also making sure that you're in compliance, making sure that, you know, your LLC is in compliance, your partnership is in compliance, and then the other big thing is making sure that you're claiming deductions in the right place. Just because you're entitled to an education deduction don't mean that you should put it on the Schedule C asking the IRS to come and audit you. Yes, you may win the audit, but the headache of going through all that is usually not worth it. Um, the other thing that we look at is not just tax preparation, but tax planning. You know, if we take this deduction this year, how is it going to impact what happens next year? Just like I was telling you with the 20% qubit deduction, one of the things that we're going to be looking at for our clients is rather than looking for ways to generate passive losses in the rental real estate, we should actually be looking for ways to have passive income in real estate so that we're able to get the 20% deduction because guess what? The depreciation and all those expenses that we would have otherwise claimed, if we say that we're not going to claim it, it's not lost. We just simply amortize the depreciation and take it in later years. So those are the kind of things that you want to be looking at. Make sure that you are not just preparing taxes, but that you're also planning um, for taxes. Um, just, you know, some of the common tax mistakes that we've seen, number one, is deducting expenses in the wrong place. Like I said, you may be entitled to a deduction, but if you're not claiming it properly, you could be asking for an audit. If you have a property you know, your tenant decides that they don't like you and they, they're going to trash the place because you're going to evict them. Now you have all these repair expenses. And maybe it's a $10,000 repair expense. It's the best thing to go and deduct $10,000 on the Schedule E or the 8825, even though you don't have any income for that year. The answer is no. You can still achieve that same deduction by depreciation and amortization and have it on that line. Why? Because you're reducing your chances of exposing yourself to an audit. Can you prove that it is a repair and not an improvement? Yes. But the time that it's going to take you going through an audit to prove that, you could be out there doing another deal. So 
deducting expenses in the wrong place is a common mistake. Another one that we see is choosing the relative professional status. Just because you're an investor or a realtor does not make you a real estate professional. A real estate professional, you have to spend at least 750 hours in real estate and, not or, and more time in real estate than in any other active profession. So Lawrence has a job 40 hours a week. The number of hours that he's working um, every year comes out to about 20, 80 hours. If he wants to be a real estate professional, he has to spend at least 750 hours a year in real estate. That comes out to about 14 hours a week, but, but more time in real estate. So more than 20 hours, 20, 80 hours in real estate than in his regular job. If he does not meet that requirement, he is not a real estate professional. The next thing is lack of proactive planning and analysis. Um, a lot of us, <clears throat> we're usually reactionary. You know, you come April 15th at 11.59 with a shoebox and you want me to do magic, it's not happening anymore. Not anymore. I'm not doing it. If we start talking about your taxes now, that's the reason why I'm giving you this information. Now is the time to start planning for 2018. You don't want to wait until April 15th of 2019 to try to start figuring out how to reduce your taxes. Now is the time to put things in place to enable you to save money. So proactive tax planning um, makes a difference. The next stage, which is the stage three that we deal with, is entity structuring and formation. And like I said, the three things that we consider in forming an entity is the legal liability, tax reduction strategies, and ease of compliance. Legal liability. Let's, we're going to look at, let me do two. We're going to look at rehabbers. I'm sure rehabbers are like happy, like she's focusing on them today. So let's do the rehabbers and the landlords. How many rehabbers do we have? Can you stand up, please? Can we clap for them? No, I'm not putting you on the spot. Just, yeah. He's like, why? <laughs> there goes my email. I love you guys. I mean, you guys, I don't know how you deal with the contractors, but I love you guys. All right. How many landlords do we have? Stand up. Oh, look at all my landlords. Yay, my people. That's good. Okay. So we're going to look at these two groups of investors. Um, for a rehabber, they hold a property for about six to eight months, sometimes a year. Um, what is the primary asset that at the end of the year, so let's say a rehabber starts with a property um, as in January. Come December, they've already sold the property. What is the asset that they have at the end of December? Cash. Well, yeah, hopefully, <laughs> or negative cash. So you're supposed to have cash. So let's put it that way at the end of the year. What kind of asset protection is needed for cash? No, asset, we're just talking legal liability now, asset protection. What kind of exposure do you have when what you, the asset that you have is cash? Yeah, FDIC, right? FDIC insurance in the bank. Because guess what? You're not really exposed to the same kind of liability that a landlord is exposed to. So while you're doing the rehab, as long as, long as you have the builder's risk insurance, the workman's come, the general liability insurance, umbrella insurance, you're kind of protected. You're not worried about the same kinds of liability that a, land, a landlord has. And so when we're talking about forming an entity for you, I'm not so focused about the legal liability and asset protection for a rehab. Let's move on to the next thing, tax reduction strategy. What are the three kinds of taxes that a rehabber has to pay? For those that have cash, that means they made money. What are the kinds of taxes that they're going to pay at the end of the year? Yes. Dealer tax, okay, but there's a technical name for it. Okay, go on. What else? What else? Huh? Capital gain? 
Absolutely not. If you're a rehabber, you can't get away with capital gains in the first year. But if you're a rehabber, you have active income. And because you have active income, you are going to be exposed to federal taxes, state taxes, self-employment. And if you're exposed to self-employment tax, what is the strategy? Our strategy is to make sure that you don't pay more than your fair share of taxes. What structure can I set up to help you reduce your tax liability? That's when we start going. Can I take questions in order? I thought you asked. Okay. So see, now I have somebody else that wants to teach. <laughs> Go ahead. Exactly. So when we're thinking about what entity structure that you need to set up, a multi-member LLC tiered structure actually works better for a rehabber because guess what? We're able to split, do what we call income splitting and split your income between what is active and what is passive. As a rehabber, there's, we look at four or five main buckets as a rehabber. You have to find the property. You have to fund the property. You have to rehab the property. You have to put the property on sale, and then you have to dispose. Five different buckets. But at the end of the day, you're only getting one check at closing, maybe $50,000. If you don't plan properly by having the right entity structure, that $50,000 will be subject to self-employment tax because you are actively involved in the rehab process. But you're able to split out that income and say, okay, finding the property is $10,000, funding it is another ten, rehabbing it is another ten, you know, getting ready for the disposition is ten, and then finally disposing of it is ten. Between those five buckets, we could make the decision that three of those are not really active, you know, in terms of like you didn't really have to do anything to find this property, a wholesaler brought it to you. So that $10,000 becomes passive. So if out of the $50,000 you made, we're saying 20 is going to be passive, 30 is active, you've reduced your self-employment tax on that $20,000 that is passive. Well, you can't achieve that if you just have all of that income being reported under the single-member LLC rather than having the multi-member um, LLC that gives you the flexibility to do a tiered structure splitting out your interest in that LLC. And then the next thing that we look at is ease of compliance. What is the best structure that would enable a rehabber not to worry about, you know, board of directors minutes, corporate minutes, and you need to file this and file that again. An LLC um, gives us that opportunity. So that's for a rehabber. Let's look at a landlord. For a landlord, um, what assets do they have at the end of the year? They have a property. When they have a property, is the property really an asset? What makes it an asset? When does it become an asset? No, because the tenants are only paying you income. And if you have income and you have expenses, what you're going to have at the end is still cash. The asset that you really have in a rental property is the equity that you have in the property. Because if a property is worth $100,000 and you have a loan of $70,000, you really have $30,000 equity. That's really what you're worried about. Because if somebody were to sue you, they still would need to satisfy that mortgage on the property. And so when we're worried about asset protection or legal liability, I'm not worried about the $100,000 fair market value. I'm worried about the $30,000 equity. Because if somebody decides to sue you, they're going to have to pay up that $70,000 first mortgage. And so the question is, what's the best way to protect the $30,000 that we have in that property? That's when we think about the structure. You can put it in an LLC. However, in the state of Maryland and in most states, the, the lenders will not finance a property in an LLC. You have to finance it in your name first. And so one of the things that we look at is get the financing in your name first, and then after closing, you transfer it into an LLC. However, if your county has transfer taxes, you now have to pay transfer taxes in order to transfer that money from your name into the LLC name. And sometimes it can run into two 
three um two three thousand dollars and then the attorney fee. So the other thing that we look at is if you have that property in your name, thirty thousand dollar equity, um, transferring it is going to be expensive. How else can we protect that property? We can protect that property by putting a lien on the property. You form a finance LLC and have that finance LLC put a thirty thousand dollar lien on this property. By doing that, you've done equity stripping. You've stripped out the equity out of that property. So that anybody that wants to sue right now would need to pay that $70,000 off for the first mortgage and pay off that second lien for the $30,000. And so when we're talking about entity structure, you kind of need to go through this to see what your exposure is before you decide what the entity structure that would help you um, protect yourself. I'll get, I'll get questions when we're done, when we get to stage four, then I'll take questions. Um, tax reduction strategy, whether you have a property in your name or in an LLC, is there a, really any tax difference? No. If you have a property in your name, rental income is passive income. If you have a property in an LLC, rental income is passive income. It really does not make a difference. So when I'm dealing with a landlord, I'm not really worried about whether their, their property is in an LLC or not. I'm more worried about legal liability. And then same thing with ease of compliance. And there's about 14, 15 real estate strategies out there. Just the two, you've seen that there's a different approach when we're talking about entity structuring and formation that you kind of need to start with your real estate strategy what is your legal exposure? What's your tax exposure? What's your compliance exposure? And then come up with the, the um, entity structure that best gives you the protection that you need. All right, common mistakes um, that I see with entity structuring is when you don't have an entity structure that shields you. Some people are happy that they have an LLC, but your LLC is toxic. Actually, it exposes you more than it protects you. Why? You don't have an operating agreement. I can go online on SDAT and see that you're the resident agent. You're using yourself. You're using your home address as the address of the LLC. In this day and age of Google Maps, don't you think that if I can figure it out, that an attorney that really wants to do your in can figure it out, that this is a primary residence, and this person that is representing me as the LLC is also the owner, they can make the connection and know that it's you. But if you don't use yourself as the resident agent, you're using a different address, a business address. If somebody, whenever you represent the LLC, you don't have to represent the LLC as the owner of the LLC. You can represent the LLC as the manager of the LLC. Because you're the manager of the LLC, you have people behind you. It doesn't matter whether you're the same person. You're the manager and the owner, but to third party, you're the manager, you're giving yourself a level of protection. So sometimes, you know, you might say that you have an LLC, but it's not really shielding you. And the example that I just gave, you have people that say, well, hey, I have my property in an LLC, that's the, um, all the asset protection that I need. No, because what did, I, what did I just say that for a landlord, what is it that you need to protect? The equity. Does that equity automatically go away when it's in an LLC? Somebody can somebody can sue the LLC. They can slip and fall on your sidewalk and decide that they're going to sue the LLC. You can have it in a truck. You say, well, I'm going to put it in a land trust. Truck help you with estate planning. It doesn't offer you, and it helps you with privacy. It doesn't offer you asset protection. A truck can be sued. And so saying that you have a property in an LLC is not adequate um, entity structure and asset protection. You do need to think about how to protect the equity because you have the bottom-up creditors, the people that can come after you. Top-down creditors can still come after the property even if it's in an LLC. Um, not understanding the two types of creditors, that's what I just mentioned. You need to understand that just having a property in an LLC is not enough asset protection. All right, so the next thing that we go through is stage four in terms of getting the entity registered. I kind of alluded to that. Make sure that when you're setting up the entity, do not use your home address. Stop being cheap. It's only $250. 
our office, we charge $100 for the use of office address. Don't use yourself as a resident agent. We charge $75 to be your resident agent. You can also use InCorp. InCorp charges $89 a year. I like InCorp because they're in all 50 states. So, you know, for I think somebody was talking about doing business out of state, you can use InCorp in any state, and they serve as your resident agent, $89 a year to keep that level of protection. And then the next thing is after you do that, get the EIN number. Remember, we just talked to wholesalers and rehabbers. I know it's easy to just go online and apply and get the EIN, but if you're not choosing the right structure and now setting up that entity so that now it has a filing requirement, you are now exposing the whole LLC. So make sure that you're getting the EIN um, the right way. Make sure that you have an operating agreement that fully protects you. You can download an operating agreement online, or you can use a real estate focused operating agreement. For our clients, we have 100, we use the Al Aiello um, operating agreement, 121 pages. An auditor comes up, boom, here. It's on page 56 of 121. They're going to have to read through that. And sometimes they just tell me, can you just tell me what it says? <laughs> These auditors, okay, that's a story for another day. But, you know, you want to make sure that you have good operating agreement. And then cash sweep. Make sure that you set up a separate bank account that you are not co-mingling. Make sure that you keep the business separate from your individual. Most of us, we don't have um, rich parents, rich uncles that are giving us money and investing in our entities. We have to fund the entities ourselves. If you have to fund the entity yourself, take the money from your personal account or the credit card, put it in the business account, and incur the expense then. Because if you get audited, and you're saying that this is a legitimate business expense, but then now you're having to provide a personal bank account, what does that say? That maybe this is a hobby. You need to make sure that you don't commingle your um, your funds when you have a business. So we will pause here now before we move on to the next stage, and then I'll take um, questions. How do they know who owns the LLC? Exactly. If you if you have so the question is that becomes a problem of not having a good attorney. <laughs> Let me give you a practical example. I had a client that was getting sued and they actually the um the creditor had a judgment against them. And, you know, they're allowed to subpoena the documents. And so they realized that this person was making money now and decided that they wanted to subpoena their LLC. Guess what was their saving grace? They did not have a single-member LLC. They had a multi-member LLC. And unless both partners, three partners, four partners are named in that LLC, you are not allowed to provide that information. You're violating the interest of the other three partners. And so because they had a really good attorney, they kind of kept the other attorney at bay until it was time to go to court and he said, Your Honor, this partnership is owned by four individuals. Only one person is named in the lawsuit. I cannot violate the privacy and confidentiality of the other partners. They were not able to get access to any information. And so they were forced to settle a $90,000 debt was ended up being paid up for $80,000. Had they had access to the information of that LLC, they would have seen that this person was able to pay that debt. And so that's why you want to make sure that, one, you have it in an LLC, do what we call a waterfall provision. My experience, I told you guys that, you know, I quit my job because, you know, I was looked over, all that. I was crying, eating fried cockroach and all that. But after all that got done and I went back to work, I was working for one of the largest real estate investors 
in the area, and the way they set up their entity is called the waterfall provision, where you have one person owns 90%, 99%, his wife owns 0.1%, his children own 0.11111%. So for every entity, there's at least five partners. And so if something comes up, nobody needs to know that, oh, the majority owns 99. All they're seeing is five partners. So that, that would help address that. When you transfer a property from your name to an LLC name, the person being able to make the connection that, oh, this property was in your name before you transferred it into an LLC, it depends on how good of an attorney you have. And, you know, sometimes we, we don't want to spend the money because I know legal fees can be expensive. But you can do things like Legal Shield, $39 a month. If something like that comes up, you call up an attorney. They're able to represent you for just that one time and say, hey, this LLC is not part of this lawsuit. Or you cannot have access to this person to know who owns it because the operating agreement, you only share it with those who you want to share it with. All right, one last question before we move on. Yes. Yes, yes, multiple bank accounts. Now, if you are rehabbing, you don't necessarily have to have multiple bank accounts for each rehab deal. You can set up sub-accounts under the parent, and then once you're done, you just keep reusing it because we're rehab. You just keep this churn. You just keep churning it. But if you have, I have several LLCs. I have the LLC that is for my practice, and then I have the LLC that I use for my rental, and then I have the LLC that I use for the rehab, and then another LLC that I use for the joint venture, and, you know, we started a nonprofit. We have a corporation for that. Compliance headache, but, you know, it's one thing that you wish you don't, you don't wish that you had it if something comes up. And so you incorporate the cost of compliance as the cost of doing business. It's almost like saying that I don't want to hire employees because then I got to do a payroll. Well, you ain't going to have no business. <laughs> so, you know, saying, no, I don't want to have all these LLCs because it's going to cost that much. Is your, are you really in business to make money or to lose money? All right, I'll take the, sorry, I'll take the last one and then I'll come back to you later when we're done because we got to start wrapping up. Yes. Yeah. Is the question you're asking about how to make money or the question about how to protect? Okay, what do you guys what do you guys think? I need because I, I covered that, so let's see. Who all here should be changing their profession to being an accountant <laughs> to investors? So the question is, for somebody that has that's a high income earner and has a rental property that has equity in it, what do they need to do to protect that equity? See, she just answered her own question. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, if you're if if the property is upside down, then there's no equity. What you have is negative equity. And if there's negative equity, they can sue all they want. They will be giving the mortgage company some money. And then when you're talking about the cash that is in the property, how much cash does she really have that somebody really can come after? I mean, as a rental property, unless that property is completely paid off, the cash flow every year is not going to be that much. It's not going to be up to twenty or, or 30000 
Because as you pay down the mortgage, the cash flow goes up. But for somebody to have a property that is upside down, they have very little that they're getting at the end of every month. So there's no there's no asset protection that is needed. There is no equity. Yeah. All right, so let's look at the next stage. Um, stage five is the um, business analysis meeting. So what we do, and this usually happens May, June, we just say forget about everything. Forget about taxes. Forget about entity structuring. How are you really doing? How is this business doing? And in some cases, I'm asking clients, why should I not fire you as a managing member of this LLC? Because if at the end of the year, all you're telling me is that you spent $20,000 on a guru a guru thing that happened in Nevada, and they taught you how you're going to you know, become like Trump and own all these assets, but I'm looking, and you lost money on the rehab, you spent $20,000 in education, why do I need to keep you as a manager member of the LLC? That's what happens in the business meeting. Because a lot of things that happen is because you don't have that check and balance where you don't have somebody holding you accountable, you assume that it's okay. So what we do is we act as your CFO for a day and say, assume that I own this business and you're coming to make a presentation to me on how you manage this business for me, you need to give me enough reasons why you need to continue managing this business. So we, we look at your expenses, and then we look at, are you achieving your goal? If the goal is, I want to be able to generate enough income in real estate so that I can leave my job, what are you doing right now? If he says on the weekend, um, I, 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 you know, I love go-kart racing, and there was this real deal meetup, but I decided to do go-karting instead of real deal meetup, just tell me one and have good reasons why I need to trust that he's going to achieve his goal. That's the whole goal of the business meeting is to come to Jesus meeting and let's look at everything that's going on and make sure that you're doing what you need to do in order for that business to succeed. For some people, it's like adding maybe a rental to their portfolio. For some people, just stay away from rehabbing. You know, these contractors don't like you. I don't like them. Just leave it alone. Let it go. Pick another real estate strategy. For other people, it could be that you have experience that you can use, let's say, in IT rather than wholesaling because wholesaling is still active income. All that energy that you're putting into wholesaling where you have an IT expertise, if you put in that same amount of time into having your own IT consultant business, at the end of the day, the cash is green. It doesn't matter where it came from. So those are the kind of things that we look at during the business meeting to make sure that the business is achieving what it needs to do. So one of the things that we're going to do, do I need to start the Okay. So <laughs> one of the things that we're going to do May, June for all our clients this year, because of all the tax law changes, last year what we focused on was the insurance policy, making sure that insurance policies are updated, the insurance is adequate, the life insurance, the hazard insurance, umbrella insurance. This year the focus is going to be with all these changes coming, you know, is your operating agreement updated? What do we need to do tax-wise? Do we need to change our withholding? That's what we're going to be focusing on for the business meeting this year. All right, the next thing that we look at is the investment property purchasing. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I know that you guys are in good hands. Um, you know, you have a lot of um, investors here who have a lot of knowledge, and they assist you when you want to buy property. But part of what we do when you're in the wealth building program is, you know, your investment property. I had a client, um, they have a property in, in Washington State, and they're going to be making almost $350,000 from that um, property, and so it's going to be capital gains. So now we're having to worry what do we need to do with this investment property so that they don't have enough exposure. I have another client that wants to buy a property. He's doing a JV with somebody else. The JV partner wants 25% and wants them to keep 75. The JV partner is only bringing $20,000. They're bringing 175,000. I said absolutely not. Tell that JV partner that I'm your partner and have them give me a call so that we can establish why you think you should be getting 25% profit when you're only bringing $20,000 to the table. 
this is all that happens on the investment property purchase and making sure that we're representing your interest. Last month, we had a client that was going to go into like a condo conversion deal, and she was bringing $300,000 to the table, but she was being made a limited partner, but then there was a general partner who was bringing less than she was bringing, and that person is the general. I know you guys have heard this kind of story before, and then at the end of the day, that money doesn't come back. Well, because they're in the wealth building program, we had our attorney take a look. And we did an analysis and told them you need to change this agreement so that it protects you. So we went from having that um, contribution of $300,000, rather than having it as a capital contribution, it became a loan that needs to be paid back first before anybody takes their profit out. So that's what happens when we do the investment property analysis. Retirement planning, we also, under that, we also help with retirement planning. You can set up a, a 401k, self-directed IRA, to help you with your investing. I prefer the 401k over and above the self-directed IRA, although, <clears throat> although they accomplish the same thing. There's more reasons why I prefer the 401k. One, with the 401k, you don't need a custodian. You are your own custodian. You can borrow up to $50,000 from it or 50% of the value of the account. The compliance fees are not as much. With, you know, this self-directed with the custodians, every time you invest, you pay money. At the end of the day, they access you based off of the value of the account. You have to get permission from them. None of that happens with the 401k. And if, remember how we talked about this new tax law where if you're making, if your taxable income is $315,000 or less, if we have somebody making $360,000 and they had a rehab this year, by setting up the 401k and having them make a contribution to that retirement account, we can bring that income under that limit to enable them get that 20% deduction. So having a retirement account as part of your investment strategy, um, it's, it's a big deal. It's something that's where you can build well off of that. So we assist with that, setting up the 401k, discussing how, you know, having money in your IRA is going to work. One major thing I wanted to mention for landlords, if you have a rental property in a self-directed IRA, this doesn't happen in a 401k, and you had debt finances, so you purchased a property for 100 the IRA came up with 20 you did financing of 80 80% of the income that you generate from that property is going to be subject to UBTI taxes because it's in a self-directed IRA. You don't have that with a 401k. And I can't tell you how many clients did not know when they were investing in, you know, like a multifamily unit that did finance, and they didn't realize that they were going to have UBTI taxes because there was a loan. And that UBTI taxes is 35%. So you're thinking, oh, I'm investing in a tax-free retirement account, but that retirement account is going to pay 35% on its income if that financing is involved. So that's, it doesn't matter, as long as there's a loan. The last page, oh my gosh, I'm done, I'm getting tired. Okay. Um, the last page is year-end tax planning. We tell clients that April 15th is the tax filing deadline, but December 31st, is your tax savings deadline. So as a real estate investor, April 15th should not mean anything to you anymore. At least if it did before, now you know it should not mean anything to you. The date that should be the most important to you is December 31st because whatever you don't put in place between now and December for 2018, come tax time, you're just reporting based on what has happened. So for our clients, November, December is when we're taking a look at everything that they had do an analysis to see if they're going to have a liability, have a refund, and what can we do to reduce that amount before the year runs out. And also that's the time that we, we need to set up entities and, you know, whatever we need to do before the end of the year. So you want to start thinking year-end tax planning. And then one of the benefits of year-end tax planning is for our clients who do year-end tax planning, we really don't see a lot of them until September, October. Because things you know what's going on, 
you don't need to meet that April 15 deadline. You just file an extension until you have a nine months. What's the benefit of waiting to file your taxes September, October? By then, you're already nine, ten months gone in the current year that if we have to do any kind of tax planning, we're able to make changes before we file the tax return. Whereas if you file April, only three months, you really don't know what has happened in 2018. Also, filing an extension, if you want to contribute to a 401k, you're allowed to contribute up to September because it includes that extension time. That gives you that flexibility of, as well. And so for most of our clients, once they've done their year-end tax plan, unless they're ready to file their taxes, most people just extend, and then we deal with their taxes September or October. All right, I'm done. So we're going to take questions now until it's time for me. I think I'm supposed to be done at 12.30, right? Yes, so we have about 20 more minutes. So I'll address any questions that you have. Okay, so we'll just start from the front end. No. Let's take her first. I told her I'll get her and then we'll start with everybody. Yes. Um, first, um, I'm going to Yes. And then, yes, and then incurring that expense from that account. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm very flexible. You just will not stress me out. So when we when people join our program or they you know take us um say that they want to use that service, I want to see what you're using now. If you're using a shoebox, that's an absolute no no. If you're on Excel, depending on how you're doing it in Excel, you may say yes or no. If you're using QuickBooks, just because people use QuickBooks doesn't mean that their their books are right. I just had a meeting with a this is very good information. I have a client, has about 25 rental properties, does a lot of rehab, $1 million rehab a year, got audited. The IRS told him he owed about $50,000, $60,000. Yesterday we just got a letter. He's getting a $20,000 refund. Do you know why that happened? Bookkeeping. Off the QuickBooks, None of the rehab costs were added to the rental properties. And so no depreciation was claimed. So just because you're using QuickBooks doesn't necessarily make you an ideal client because when I go in and start doing the smell test, I realize that there's a lot of things that were not put on there properly. So now I have him going back as far back as 1989. He had to provide me with the HUD ones, rehab costs, any refis that happen, and we're now going through and calculating the cost basis for all the properties so that we can properly take depreciation. And then for the years where the depreciation may be low, we're going to do cost segregation and split out the components between what's FF&E and building so that he's able to get more back. So guess what happened? When the IRS auditor, this is 2014, when the IRS auditor realized that um, they owe us money, now she wanted to close 2013. I opened it. We're going to open 13. We're going to open 15. And I'm going back all the years. And we're going to, because now she sees, because if you go back and look at the other years, there is no depreciation on those rental properties. So having QuickBooks, you know, I just had a meeting with a bookkeeper. And that typically happens for a lot of my clients. A lot of bookkeepers don't know how. Um, to keep the right books for investors. You know, you, you have a rehab property. They automatically book all of your rehab expenses as an expense in the current year. It is not an expense. It goes into inventory until that property is sold. But most of them don't understand that. So we have to train your bookkeeper to be able to keep your books in the way that helps you during tax time. Yes. Sorry, yeah, him at the back and I'll get you. Uh -huh. So um, the wealth building program is actually twenty nine ninety five two thousand because somebody said twenty nine is it twenty nine dollars and ninety five cents? Don't insult me. 
$2,995. It covers all of our services for the year. If you are a member of this club and either Brittany, Brian, or Charles has to approve you, um, you get a $500 discount, so you get it at $2,495. The reason why I did not mention the price is because we're starting to close the window on the wealth building program because I only want to work with a certain number of clients. If I have way too many clients, unless I'm able to expand and bring in another CPA, it starts to impact the services that I'm offering to my clients who are currently in the wealth building program. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. If you're in the wealth building program here and you want to talk about it, I can give you some time to speak. Yes, you brought up a good point. So tax preparation, you know because the miscellaneous deduction is no longer allowed, that means that you can no longer deduct tax preparation. But guess what? If you're in the wealth building program, how much is allocated to tax preparation? We make that decision. Absolutely not. A dollar. If I consult for you, I'll do your taxes for free. Who's to say that that can't happen? So what we do is we're able to allocate that expense amongst what's tax preparation, what's consulting, what's the investment property, what's the retirement planning, what's the entity structure, so that at the end of the day, what's allocated tax prep is not going to be as much. Let me get let me get him first, and then I'll get. I have are you able to convert that into a self-directed? No, because it's been designated for education. There is an account, though, I can't remember the name of it. I think it's the ABLE. You're able to use the ABLE for that. Like, one of them converts, but I think it's the ABLE, but not so far. And my next question was, you were saying to eliminate the Okay, so the question is if you're not able to if you're not able to um find a partner for the LLC, where do you find um the LLC? That was a question that was asked at the back and we said you can form a single member LLC and that single member LLC becomes a partner. And also, depending on the kind of benefits that you have, fringe benefits or whatever, you can have that LLC tax as a C-Corp to enable you to claim those fringe benefits. We offer where we can be your partner, but we're closing that down because, like I said, we have a lot of people that are in the wealth building program, so that's only available for those who are currently in the wealth building program. So you can join the wealth building program, but we can we cannot, you know, be your partner for now until... You guys pray for me. I need to find another CPA who is real estate staff. Yes. Yes. You can pay it monthly or you can do four payments, but there is a premium. So if you're going to do the $24.95, that's $24.95. But if you're going to split out the payments, there's a premium for that. Yes. Sorry, um, the guy in the red shirt, and then I'll take you. Yes. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay. I don't want to see you. No. <laughs> go ahead. Yes. Yes, so what we do is we have a sample business workbook for general expenses for um rehabbers, you know, calculating your capital gains, and also for the rental properties, we can train you on how to use them. If you want us to use it and convert for you, we'll set that up for you as a separate fee, and then we'll send that information to you, and then you use it going forward. We have, it depends on the volume, because some volume we will not even accept. We'll have our bookkeeper handle that. That's why it's important not to wait until the last minute. I will not be doing any shoebox bookkeeping during tax season anymore. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so I want to make sure I understand the question. You said that I mentioned several ways of protecting your assets in an LLC outside of um, equity stripping. What are some of those ways? It's the um, doing an umbrella policy is one. Having a general liability insurance is another way. So you don't only have to protect your, your assets um, through equity stripping. If you have a really good insurance policy, and then also for the landlord. I mean, stop trying to be cute and, you know, let those people know that you're the owner. You're a landlord. You're the manager. So what happens is when people call me, uh, Mr. Bear, I can't pay my rent here tomorrow. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me talk to the owner because I'm the manager, and I'm not sure whether they will allow it. I really wish they would allow it and be nice, but they have policies and I don't want to get fired. Let me call you back. Hang up the phone. A bear? We have this tenant here who don't want to pay their rent and they need like five days or something. Um, what do you want to do? Take up the court. Okay. Pick up the phone. I'm sorry, the owner didn't approve it. They said I have to file. I'm going to give you a five day notice. I kind of understand. I mean, I'll explain to the owner that you're a good tenant. But I have to do what they told me to do. I will still file the papers in court, but if you pay if you pay your rent within five or ten days, we're going to be able to waive the court fee. And so, hey, Bear, please put in a good word. You know, I try, I'll, I'll let them know and hang up, okay? Bear, they said I should let you know. Yes, did you file those papers? Yes, I will file it. No tenant needs to know that you own the property. Keep a level of separation between you and the tenant. Because one thing is, is knowledge. Knowledge is power. They don't need to know that you own the property. You control the property. The whole thing about um, investing in real estate is control. Control without disclosure. You don't have to disclose that you have control, but you can still manage. It's almost like a regular job. When you're at your regular job, there is somebody that is behind the desk that is the owner, but you still do things on behalf of that entity. You need to kind of wear that hat when you're doing real estate. That's another way of protecting because now when you're representing yourself to potential creditors, they know that this person is not available and they can't see them and they know that it's not you. All right, last question and then we can round up. Yes. Oh, okay, two more. We'll take one. Let's clap for him. Congratulations. You made you you took the very first step and that's important. Okay. Okay. I know we have some seasoned investors here. Can anybody help me out? His question is for a newbie. What does he need to do in terms of entity structuring? What does he need to do in terms of CPAs, accountants, building his power team? What would you what what do you want to tell him? <laughs> there you go. So contact me and we'll do an initial consultation. But let's just let's just help it. You guys need to be nice. Give him more information so that he can come back. What do you want him to do for entity structure? What how do we make that decision? on the entity structure that he needs to go with. There you go. Be my people. I think it's the women that respond as far as So the first question is, what is your real estate strategy? Because based on your real estate strategy, then we can make a recommendation on the structure that works with that strategy. Okay. So for a buy and hold investor, what do you think he needs? He needs an LLC, but what needs to happen first? Because to be buy and hold, you have to purchase the property first. So what do you think he needs to do first? Get the, I love these girls. The women, guys, you all have to step up. The guys, the, the ladies are killing it. Because you're buy and hold, it's going to be difficult for you to purchase that property in an LLC. So take care of the finances first, because if they require you to finance in your name, getting an LLC now is not going to do anything but you spending money that you don't 
necessarily need to spend right now. Get the financing, get the property in your name, and then now start thinking about asset protection, forming the LLC or doing the equity stripping. Because guess what? If you're buying a property in a county that requires transfer taxes, an LLC is not going to do anything for you either. Because the cost of transferring that property from your name to the LLC name is also going to be accepted. Usually it's like $2,000 for $100,000 of value. Was that enough information? And did you fill out the sheet? Okay. All right, one last, I think somebody at the back had one last, yes, that would be our final question for the day. Has a tax... Mm-hmm. Yes, but really important, it can be a nonprofit, but guess what? The nonprofit has a tax exempt purpose, which is to offer nonprofit work, and being involved in real estate is not tax exempt purpose. So remember when I talked about the IRA having to pay UBTI taxes? That nonprofit, if it gets any income allocated to it from the real estate, because it's not in the business of doing real estate, it's a tax exempt, it's going to have the UBTI taxes to pay. However, if you made it a point zero 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 one percent maybe nothing will be allocated, so there's nothing to worry about. All right, that's it, guys. It's been fun coming here. <laughs>